Okay, and with that, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Uh, Nuzzo to lead us in a, her discussion today on uh, the challenges uh, for the U.S. response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Nuzzo. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the um, having the opportunity to address this group. Um, you know, as you probably could glean from my bio, I am not a clinician, um, and I'm very mindful of the fact that I'm speaking to people who are truly on the front lines of this pandemic. I know you're putting your lives on the line um, to protect all of us, and I am very, very grateful that for that work. And um, you know, humbled by, I'm sure, what you are all um, seeing and learning and the enormous challenges um, that you must be experiencing in all of this. Um, it's my hope today just to maybe offer a bit of a broader view uh, in terms of what's going on across the U.S. and, and to some extent globally um, in so much as I think some of these uh, trends and challenges that we are seeing um, will ultimately, um, you know, um, affect what's happening within hospitals. Um, but I do hope that there's an opportunity to learn from um, you all directly about what you're seeing, because I think having clinical voices uh, is absolutely essential in trying to understand how we should best approach um, this really unprecedented challenge. And I really um, encourage, uh, you know, um, two-way communication on this, um, because uh, I, I think those who are on the front lines, um, you really have the most to, to offer in terms of um, how we should be thinking about this. Um, as mentioned, I direct something called the Outbreak Observatory, and we started the observatory a few years ago um, with the goal of trying to um, engage uh, those who are on the front lines of outbreak responses, uh, because we know that there's just a tremendous amount of knowledge that's amassed in responses to outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics um, that just um, tends to stay in the minds of the people who have had the experiences. And um, we felt that there needed to be a dedicated mechanism to try to um, learn from those uh, practitioners' experiences. And what we found is that often the people who know the most are the busiest and they unfortunately never stop being busy. And so our goal in starting the observatory was to find a way to partner with practitioners to do operational research to improve our understanding of how we should better be responding to infectious disease outbreaks. Um, and we're really here as sort of a force extender uh, to kind of bring in additional resources to try to um, help design research questions and help collect uh, data and analyze them and ultimately publish them. Um, but with, you know, practitioners as um, co-authors. Um, we, we do this um, because we want these studies to be done. Um, and in an ideal world, we don't have to be involved that practitioners would have time and space and bandwidth to do this on their own. But um, unfortunately, as I said, um, you know, uh, people who know the most are probably the busiest. So um, we've been doing uh, various different research projects. And one of the other things our observatory does is we try to kind of continually scan the world and see what's going on and just to kind of keep eyes on situations that may um, have relevance later and to try to understand them as they're emerging and share information. And so we publish a weekly blog. It's called the Outbreak Thursday blog. Um, as the name suggests, it's published every Thursday and we try to cover an outbreak that's happening, try to be um, timely and topical and to try to add to um, maybe some of the reporting that may be done, maybe an analysis that isn't particularly covered or, or considered. And so um, at the end of December, um, like others, we um, you know, became aware of a, an outbreak that was being reported in Wuhan, China. And it was a outbreak of um, unknown viral pneumonia. And um, even you know, at the end of December, early January, um, people began wondering whether this could be the start of another SARS-like uh, epidemic. So we covered uh, this outbreak on our blog post and tried to analyze what was known at the time. Obviously, a lot has changed since then, and this is now, um, you know, not we we now have a, a name for the disease, COVID-19, and um, you know the the virus has been identified. It's now been found to um, be a virus that's. Um, capable of relatively efficient human-to-human -human transmission and not just associated with exposure to a seafood market, which was thought at the time. But I think this um, early uh, report is important because um, one of the things 
we knew for sure um, at this point was that clinicians were incredibly important to the discovery of this outbreak. Namely, there were a few clinicians who were seeing um, you know, a number of cases of viral pneumonia and um, maybe that wasn't um, unusual in and of itself, but they did notice that a number of the patients seemed to have a common occupational exposure to a seafood market. And based on that, they alerted health authorities, um, you know, suspecting that something was unusual, and that ultimately launched the investigation um, of, you know, the first investigation of this situation. So um, I think an important lesson here is the critical importance of astute clinicians and their role in, in detection of these um, significant events. And um, I think in particular, uh, they're going to, um, clinicians are incredibly important in early detection of these events. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we now know versus what we knew at the end of December. And um, obviously a lot has changed and there's still a lot we don't know. I'm going to try to do my best to share what I think is known at this point, um, recognizing that this could change in a few days or even a, even a few weeks. But I'd rather try to give you a sense of what I think rather than say, I don't know, I don't know. Um, but I hope that you'll understand that, um, you know, this is clearly a situation in flux and our understanding of this virus has changed um, quite a bit since uh, we first uh, became aware of it. So one of the things that we now know um, is that uh, the um, virus that was identified, a um, new coronavirus, um, it um, did not appear to be purely linked to that um, seafood market. And in fact, um, you know, within a relatively short period of time, um, it was determined that this uh, virus was capable of sustained human to human transmission. And that really separates it from the previous uh, um, outbreak of a novel coronavirus, MERS, which although um, human to human transmission has been observed, um, it not particularly in a sustained fashion um, say outside of health settings um, or you know in, in the larger community and so that's one of the things I think we learned um, fairly on and clearly the fact that we're in a global pandemic is is strong evidence of that um, another important detail and uh, what I'm showing here is one of the first studies that was published in about um, this uh, what is now a pandemic but at the time it was um, still you know a large outbreak bordering on an epidemic um, is uh, there's indication that this likely started well before most of the world heard about it. Possibly the first cases occurring in early December, which could mean an exposure in November. There's been some studies that suggest maybe, or some reports that suggest that maybe this even started earlier. Um, but what it suggests to us is that this has been going on for quite some time. And I think that has relevance when we think about where the virus may have traveled um, before we became aware of it and before countries responded with, um, you know, re relatively unprecedented travel restrictions. Uh, just thinking about how much virus may have already occurred, I think is, is an important question to ponder. Um, there have been studies that have also shown us that this virus is capable of a spectrum of illness, um, ranging from quite mild infection to uh, more serious infections requiring hospitalization and, and critical care. Um, some of these studies have looked at uh, kind of post factors that might be associated with um, uh, re uh, requiring clinical care. And um, most of these are, you know, underlying conditions that um, are also associated with um, severe illness due to other respiratory viruses like influenza, so things like hypertension or cardiovascular disease. Um, diabetes, uh, lung disease, important um, potential uh, factors associated with um, development of, um, of severe illness. Um, a study published by China CDC looking at uh, more than 44,000 patients um, t showed us that a range of ages can be infected with the virus, though um, uh, you know, initially, I think it was notable that um, very f a small percentage of the cases um, involve children. Um, and I think our understanding of the extent to which this virus can affect children ha has changed. But um, that, I think, was a notable finding initially and, and also um, consistent with what has been observed in prior uh, coronavirus outbreaks, such as SARS and MERS. 
um, the study also reinforced some of the, um, you know, kind of host factors underlying health conditions um, that may uh, be associated with um, with um, severe outcomes like death. Uh, also reinforce that. Um, just kind of wanted to go back a second to the age. Um, you know, I think while uh, we have since seen that um, really uh, patients of any age can experience severe illness, um, the majority of deaths are in those um, greater than 60 years of age, and in particular in um, subsequent studies um, greater than 80 years of age. So um, we haven't yet, to my knowledge, done any of the studies that try to delink age and um, some of the underlying health conditions. Um, but I think this is an important uh, thing to be aware of. As I said, our understanding about how this virus may affect children has changed. Um, there is a study recently published in the Journal of Pediatrics um, that did show that um, children of, of all ages um, can become infected with the virus. Um, and it did show that um, the uh, level of severity in children was less than that of adults, which um, was uh, seen in a lot of the surveillance um, information that preceded this study, though they did note um, some severe outcomes in children. Um, it's a little bit challenging because some of the, the more severe outcomes um, tended to be in the suspected category rather than the laboratory confirmed category. And the, the study authors pointed out that um, that suspected category, it wasn't possible to rule out the role of other, um, you know, whether, whether those outcomes were due to other viruses such as RSV. But nonetheless, I think it has um, shown us that um, you know, children can in fact um, become in infected with the virus. We still don't know to what extent children transmit the virus, and that's, um, I think, an area of active discussion and probably debate. Um, and um, I, I know that there are studies underway trying to understand um, whether children play the same role for this virus as they do for influenza, where children are known to be um, amplifiers of, of or they, they tend to be important contributors to overall transmission of influenza in communities. Um, we don't yet have data to show this in children, and it's not clear if they play the same role, but um, that's just an area, that's one of those kind of uh, questions that hasn't been resolved yet. Uh, I just want to see anything here. Uh, now I think just here's a link to the study if you'd like to see it. So um, I ended a little bit on that section on the unknown, which is to what extent um, children may be spreading the virus, but there are still a number of, I think, important unknowns about this virus um, that, you know, kind of limit our understanding of, you know, how to, how best to respond and just kind of summarize where I think the, the what the key questions are at this point that um, it would be nice to have better data for. The first one still, and this has really been since the beginning, is um, about severity. And, um, you know, WHO has said that about 82% of the reported cases, um, they initially said this when they had a cohort of about 17,000, uh, actually it wasn't a cohort, it was um, when they had received about seven um, information on the first 17,000 cases, um, and, but I believe that this these percentages have largely held up since then. Um, that um, about 82 percent of the cases were mild, 15 percent severe, three percent are critical. Obviously, if you look in any one place, these numbers um, can change depending on the age structure of the the um, population and you know level of underlying health conditions, et cetera. But um, you know overall, I think these are fairly good estimates still. Um, for a long time, if you just took the number of deaths being reported and you tried to divide that into the total number of cases in an attempt to calculate case fatality, um, it was about 2%. And that has changed um, with the addition of uh, countries like Iran and Italy, where they have had quite severe epidemics um, with large numbers of deaths for reasons that are yet not fully understood. Um, but likely could be due to when they um, first started finding cases and, and the underlying health and age of the population uh, affected. And so that number has ticked up a bit. 
Um, I, as an epidemiologist, um, don't particularly like these calculations. I think they're not quite, they're not, they're not close to accurate because um, I think when we have a disease where uh, there's a range of uh, symptoms being reported and um, where we have a fairly good sense that there may be many, many mild cases not being detected by our existing surveillance systems. Um, I think that these uh, um, just kind of raw case fatality calculations probably overestimate um, the severity of uh, associated with this virus. Some have pointed to um, one of the a study that was done on one of the cruise ships um, that was, you know, a, a fairly large population of people potentially exposed and a bit of a little contained system that you could study um, transmission and and um, case fatality um, kind of absent interventions initially, um, because as you know, those uh, cruise ship passengers were sort of kept on board for a fairly long time. And from this study, um, it's possible that case fatality associated with this virus might be lower, possibly closer to 1%. Um, even that cruise ship um, had, um, you know, kind of a, a fairly, it kind of skewed more elderly in, in the population of um, passengers on it. So even that might be a little bit more of a overestimate of um, fatality compared to sort of a general kind of more evenly distributed age population. But um, I think it shows that there could be a real range and um, we still don't really have a good handle on what the severity is, particularly given uh, weaknesses, ongoing weaknesses in surveillance for, um, for this virus. Many people are trying to compare um, COVID-19 to influenza. Um, there's been a lot of debate over whether this is just like seasonal flu, um, particularly pointing to some bad flu years. And I just kind of wanted to show for here for here in the United States what the kind of estimated range of Ill, number of illnesses and hospitalizations and deaths for seasonal flu is. This was from 2017, which I'm sure you all probably remember as a particularly bad flu year. And this is just to say that, you know, if we just did the raw calculation of severity, um, this uh, COVID-19 is more severe than uh, than seasonal flu. So um, whether that number will ultimately hold up remains to be seen, but I think based on these initial uh, data points, we have a lot of reason to be deeply worried about this uh, virus for that reason. Um, this doesn't seem to be like seasonal flu. Um, I think another important reason why we should be worried is that, um, as I'm sure you all are well aware, we don't have the same kind of tools to combat it like we do seasonal influenza. So limited diagnostics, um, you know, uh, limited surveillance. Um, we don't have uh, targeted uh, therapies or even a vaccine and may not have either of those for quite some time. So. Um, Numbers aside, case fatality ratios aside, just the absence of these tools make um, controlling this situation uh, much more difficult than, than flu. So since this uh, outbreak first um, emerged in China, it has now gone on to um, spread around the world, becoming a global pandemic. Um, these I, numbers I grabbed off of the WHO website this morning, they're from yesterday, just to show that we are now over um, 300,000 confirmed cases. I give this talk about once a week and every time I update this slide, it basically jumps by more than 100,000. So um, at least in the last couple of weeks. So just to show you the pace at which um, these numbers are accelerating. And as you can see, um, you know, Europe in particular is hard hit. Um, United States now, uh, just recently the WHO um, suggested that the United States could become another epicenter of um, really uh, rapidly increasing transmission like um, Europe was and continues to be. Um, I think the United States is um, starting to follow case numbers wise and case increase wise um, in the footsteps of some European countries. Here is a um, probably more up-to-date map. I grabbed this this morning from um, a COVID tracker dashboard that my colleague at the School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University, her name's Lauren Gardner, she created this um, map and COVID tracker, and I think it's a really great resource. It provides the most up-to-date um, case counts and um, case visualizations um, that I've seen, and um, I think it's become a real global resource. I'm very grateful to Lauren for 
for putting this together. But um, as you can see, uh, really, particularly if you look at the the kind of um, graphic on the, the bottom right hand side, you can just see how the, the case numbers have really accelerated um, over time. Um, and that's obviously a, a very worrisome trend here. We now have 169 countries reporting cases. And um, I think another way that this situation differs from seasonal flu or even pandemic influenza, which occurred in 2009, is that um, I don't think we can be confident that the absence of dots on a country signify the absence of cases or that the size of the dots in countries um, is a true representation of the number of cases that they have. Um, you know, this is a completely new virus. And the fact that we have been able to stand up surveillance in 169 countries in a matter of months, I think is an important uh, success that we should um, acknowledge, but also recognize that um, surveillance is still severely limited and different countries have different motivations for expanding surveillance and different countries have different capacities, including here in the United States, as I'm sure you're well aware of the difficulties in, in testing people for COVID-19 still, despite strong political pressures to try to um, expand testing. Um, I did reference 2009 H1N1, and just to say that um, here's just a map from back then, if everybody doesn't remember, um, you know, we saw once we recognized that we a, a new flu strain had emerged and was capable of um, human to human transmission, signifying the start of a pandemic, uh, really the virus showed up um, all around the world within, this is I think a month after sort of first recognition. And I think um, the number of cases or countries shown here is a function of the fact that there was just much more surveillance for flu at the time um, compared to this virus where you really had to, you know, develop and deploy a, a, a new test in a way that wasn't quite the same for, for influenza. I think this is also a hallmark of um, respiratory viruses in general. Um, over the summer, I wrote a report um, that was commissioned by the, um, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, which is a kind of high level panel that's um, meant to kind of weigh in on preparedness for all sorts of um, infectious disease emergencies, including a pandemic. And um, they commissioned our group to write a report on um, preparedness for a high impact respiratory pathogen pandemic. Um, it was sort of, uh, uh, I guess, I don't know if you want to call it um, conveniently timed or um, poorly timed, I don't know, um, but we, we published this report over the summer. And one of the conclusions of our report was that respiratory viruses are particularly challenging uh, case to respond to because they, they just, they spread very rapidly and it becomes very difficult to intervene with traditional methods, you know, even um, the kinds of measures that you would take to slow the spread of disease is very difficult when you have relatively short incubation periods and very non-specific symptoms. And so um, once we started seeing that this virus was capable of sustained human to human tr transmission, I mean, I pretty much expected us to be in a pandemic, you know, very early on. And unfortunately, here we are. Um, this is just to show you that the majority of the spread that's occurring now is occurring outside of China, um, which you're probably aware of given that China took very, very um, aggressive, I guess you could call it actions to try to uh, lock down society and prevent the virus from transmitting. And in the last few days, they've had just you know a handful of case reports uh, of new cases, um, not to say that there might not be other cases happening in the country that aren't detected, but um, really in terms of reported cases, um, you know, right now Europe is is dominating, um, but I think the United States is is going to catch up soon. Um, a number of countries, the U.S. included, responded to the um, the beginning epidemic, and now you know even before it was a pandemic officially recognized as a pandemic or unofficially recognized before we we started routinely calling it a pandemic. A number of countries um, responded by um, implementing travel restrictions. And just to show you here, I mean, I, I'm not particularly convinced that it um, stopped the virus. As you can see, a number of the countries in red, um, their case numbers um, rose substantially despite having um, relatively aggressive travel bans. And so um, 
I, I haven't been particularly convinced of the, the impact of these bans, um, just, just given these data. But um, one of the reasons why I haven't been um, so uh, convinced is that I wasn't, I didn't see any country doing the kind of testing that would be necessary to show that the travel bans um, had an impact. Um, as you probably know, just from your own clinical experience, uh, for a very, very long time, in fact, only until somewhat recently, uh, people couldn't be tested for uh, you know, COVID-19 unless they uh, had traveled to Wuhan or if they were had traveled to broader China, you know, they were sick enough to be hospitalized. And so um, if you shut down the number of people who uh, come from China, then um, your ability to find cases is going to be, you know, you're going to have fewer cases that you're going to detect, but that doesn't mean those are the only cases that you have. And this just kind of illustrates what I just said. This, these were the, the um, criteria for testing until um, quite recently. And um, we're still using travel as a qualifier in many places for testing, in part because we don't have enough tests and we have to kind of make a cut somehow. And so um, there are now more countries on the list um, and different states have different approaches. Um, some states have, have done away with it, but other states still, still, um, still use previous travel as, as a, uh, criteria for testing. So um, it's just to say that um, I don't think our current surveillance is really set up to um, fully support finding local transmission or enumerating how much uh, virus is, is is occurring within our borders or really even identifying transmission chains in ways that we would hope. Um, and this is in part due to very constrained resources for, for testing. So that brings us to issues facing the US. Um, and I think the testing one is a really important one. But, um, you know, I think the US response um, and the, the, the urgency in the US response um, changed somewhat recently, in part because of signals from Italy and seeing a very rapid expansion in the number of cases and a rapid expansion in the number of cases requiring a hospitalization and ultimately critical care and a surge in the number of deaths. Um, many people in the policy community uh, looked to reports from Italy with deep worry that the US was potentially on that trajectory, possibly a few weeks behind. Um, it's hard for me to know where we are in our epidemic here in the United States, because as I said, testing has been so constrained for so long. I don't feel like we have a sense of how many have had it already to know enough whether we're just kind of tuning into a program that's just just starting or whether we're kind of, um, you know, dialing into one that's kind of, you know, well, uh, has, you know, uh, has been progressing for some time. Um, nonetheless, the possibility of our being on track to, um, uh, you know, follow in Italy's footsteps in terms of um, a demand for healthcare resources that far outstrips uh, capacity is a deep worry. And this is why many states across the US have responded with very, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, important um, social distancing measures like canceling public gatherings and, uh, you know, closing businesses and, um, uh, you know, trying to encourage people to stay home as much as possible. The goal here in these measures is not necessarily to ultimately change the number of people who become ill, but to reduce the numbers who become ill on any one day in the hopes that we can slow the spread such that we can better preserve the, um, you know, healthcare resources that we have so that we're not on you know, on on the trajectory to rapidly exceed what's available. Um, here's where we are as of yesterday, I believe, in terms of the growth in the US cases. And um, as you can see, you know, we are on a rapidly accelerating curve. Now, where I live in Maryland, we're about in week two of um, social distancing. And, you know, almost every day or every other day, the, the governor, announces new measures. Uh, yesterday, um, non-essential businesses were closed. We are not under kind of lockdown or do not go, go out orders that other states are under, but um, many states are implementing some version of, of these sorts of measures. 
And it's too early to say what impact, if any, these measures are having. Um, I think it stands to reason that if people don't circulate in the community, the probability that they'll transmit their infection will be reduced. How much, I think, depends on adherence and um, whether it's enough in terms of offloading from the health system, I think is also an open question. Nonetheless, unfortunately, I don't see an alternative to these approaches right now. Um, I do think that it's necessary to try to um, stop the rapidly accelerating case numbers, or not that I think we will be able to stop it, but to slow it such that we can get a better handle on what's happening and hopefully try to reduce some of the strain on the health system. Um, that said, this is not a permanent strategy because um, you know, even China that has responded very aggressively will have to get back to work. We need China to get back to work. China is a major producer of products that we rely on, personal protective equipment, essential medicines, and not producing at the level they once did has put a strain on global supply chains. So we need China to get back to work, but many are deeply worried that when China starts to get back to work, their case numbers will go back up again because people will remain susceptible to this virus. And as long as the virus is still out there, there is the possibility that people could become effect, infected yet again. This is the same challenge that the US will face. If these measures that we're taking now work in the sense that we kind of bend the curve or flatten the curve, as you've heard people talk about, um, it will only last for as long as we implement these measures. And obviously that's quite hard to think about for the long term. So we need to identify next phase, what comes after this? Um, because I think it's going to be very hard for societies to um, sustain this kind of disruption for um, possibly the many, many months to, you know, extended period of time that might be necessary. So there's some thinking going on trying to figure out what the next phase is. And I can talk a little bit when I point to some data later of what the next phase possibly should look like. But just to say that the measures that are being taken now in many states, I think are important and necessary. Um, but by themselves not going to fix our problem. I just wanted to point out sort of an important thing that's happening right now. Clearly infection prevention in health facilities is important. I know that there are extraordinary challenges with this right now in terms of really unbelievable shortages and lack of supply chain management and just difficulties in getting access to the most basic of tools. And I, I feel really awful that um, anyone may have to show up to work in this situation. Um, it's, um, it's frankly unacceptable in my view, but um, I'm very grateful that there are brave people who are doing the best they can to save lives. Um, so really thank you for that. Um, there's clearly um, other actions to be taken in the communities and I'll talk a little bit about um, when I talk about other countries, what they've done, um, what, uh, what other community actions we may need to see in the US. Um, the situation here in the US with difficulties in supply chains, um, it's not just PPE, as you probably know, um, the FDA reported a um, interruption of a medicine, though for some reason didn't report what medicine it was, which I'm sure doesn't make it easy for people to plan. But I think we should expect to see more interruptions in the medical supply chain. I'm hoping as China gets back to work, maybe that'll ease things a little bit. But um, you know, we have never before been in a situation where every country in the world is essentially wanting the same things at the exact same time. And I, I just don't think the supply chain that was developed um, for maximum efficiency and cost reduction um, is really as um, robust as it needs to be for these sorts of situations. Um, as I said, these shortages are, are being felt all over the world, in particular on PPE. The World Health Organization um, has called this out as a challenge and is um, you know, really trying to pressure governments and industry to do whatever they can to try to um, increase manufacturing of PPE. Um, but like I said, um, you know, the places where these things are made are limited and everybody wants it. So that's a real challenge. Um, obviously, not having PPE for healthcare workers is a challenge. And um, I just wanted to point out um, 
some of the kind of early reports where healthcare workers were um, exposed to uh, patients who are ultimately later tested for COVID-19. Some health systems um, responded by placing those exposed healthcare workers on quarantine. I've heard from some health facilities that this is not really a sustainable approach because um, health workers are one of our um, precious limited resources right now. And um, it doesn't seem to me that that's this that we can afford to have people come out of rotation at this time. Um, so I think this is just a challenge that's going to need to be addressed going forward and figuring out what the right approach is. I know other health systems have basically said, we, we, we can't do this and we're just going to have to monitor symptoms and possibly provide PPE to, to um, you know, as a matter of priority to those healthcare workers who've been exposed and, um, you know, only, of course, um, come out of off rotation if, um, you know, they develop symptoms or test positive. One of the worries that I have is um, with every country wanting essentially the same thing, to what extent will or will not, I mean, we don't know, but um, I think it's, it's something to ponder whether countries will nationalize whatever resources they have. And um, there have been a couple of other reports since this one, but this is one of the early reports that worried me, which was, um, you know, the possibility of India, which was seeing a decrease in, in some of um, the ingredients that it was using for medicines, um, uh, curbing exports. We've heard of PPE exports um, being limited from, from uh, Europe. And so I think this idea that countries will try to hold on to whatever they have um, is possibly something that we should expect. And I think this is going to be really challenging because, like I said, um, production of the supplies are not uh, ubiquitous. And um, right now, um, there are just a few places in the world where a lot of these things are made. And so um, if countries are going to take this approach, I think it's going to really have to force domestic production. So just looking ahead, I get frequently asked by media and family and just people generally, like how long, you know, is this all gonna last? You know, when is this all gonna be over? And um, it's really hard to say, uh, you know, I think there's some hope that maybe the, the warmer temperatures or the summer will somehow bring a reprieve that maybe there'll be a seasonality to how this virus is transmitted. Um, we have no real data or information to go on for that. Um, it would be nice if that happened for sure. It doesn't mean that we would be out of the woods though. Um, so we need to think of if that did happen, what would happen if there were a re resurgence of cases in, in the fall. Um, this graph that I show here is from a model that was done by the Imperial College of London um, that essentially showed that the social distancing measures in order to kind of reduce it to below the red line, which is um, um, critical a surge, critical care bed capacity, uh, that these measures would really have to be maintained for quite some time. They used an 18 month time period, um, likely because that's been reported as, as an estimate of when we might have a vaccine. Um, I always want to point out that if the science works in our favor, it's possible we could have a vaccine in 18 months, but a vaccine will need to be produced and to get to the point where we have you know, um, commercial capacity, you know, production at scale. I mean, I think it'll be many years before we have enough vaccine um, in quantities that are enough to make a difference. So um, I think this means we need to come up with the next phase. And I don't see how it's possible for societies to maintain this level of uh, restriction for that long. So I think we, we absolutely need to, to know what comes next and what we can possibly do to allow um, society to return to some level of functioning. I don't mean now, and I know it's been reported politically that people are pressuring to return you know, in the next few weeks. I absolutely don't mean that. I think we need to maintain the measures that we're doing for some time, but we do need to plan for the future and, and a way to allow some uh, return to functioning. I didn't want to leave on a depressing note. I wanted to just kind of point to what's potentially possible. And just showing here data from Singapore. Singapore did not take the broad societal measures that the US or China has taken. They didn't close schools. They didn't close businesses. But what they did was they were very aggressive in um, identifying cases 
isolating cases, and then identifying contacts and quarantine contacts of cases. And um, in doing this, this sort of case finding, isolation, quarantine combination, um, they were really able to um, reduce their um, uh, case incidents in, in, in quite impressive ways. Now, it's unclear to what extent we can copy what Singapore did. There are some different politics there, and they involve law enforcement and some of those activities, and that alone may be a bit of a challenge here in the United States, and I'm not even sure it's desirable. I actually don't think it's desirable for us to do, but I think it really points to the need to, in the next phase, to think about how we can um, better identify cases and isolate them. Um, hopefully, if they're mild enough to be isolate them at home or definitely not to use hospital beds for them, um, but also to identify who may have been exposed to these cases so that they can be aware and, and monitor themselves for symptoms and um, isolate themselves as soon as they um, are, are diagnosed. But this will require um, more testing than we're able to do now. So this is something that I think is important for us to work on and plan for, but we're not there yet. Um, the WHO has really pleaded with countries to not just do things like lockdown um, cities, but also to think about um, enhanced case finding and, and expanding testing. Um, test, test, test is what the WHO Director General has said, um, and in part because of the model that I showed you, which is that, you know, the social distancing alone is, is not enough to solve our problems. And so, you know, really what's going to be necessary is um, doing a better job of finding out who's sick and um, allowing them to um, enable them to be isolated so that they don't transmit their infection onto others. Um, another country that's been sort of praised for its response is South Korea. Um, they um, sort of take the prize out of any country for um, the highest percentage of their population tested. Uh, you know, they've tested hundreds of thousands of, of people. Um, they rapidly expanded their testing. They use all sorts of innovative approaches like drive-through models that actually um, work. You know, they, they're not um, subject to many hour bottlenecks. Um, they have um, really interesting uh, IT capacities to do contact tracing. Um, so that contacts of cases can be identified and, and, um, and so that they can stay home and, um, while, and, 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 and be observed um, to see if they um, develop symptoms. So I think some of the approaches that Singapore and South Korea have employed um, potentially show us what could be a possible next phase for the U.S. And just to show, here's, a, I think, a curve. We're talking about bending the curve. And if you can see the green bars, I mean, South Korea's approach enabled them to bend the curve. Um, their case um, incidents fell quite a bit. Now, they have had a different epidemic than other countries have had. Um, their um, cases largely occurred in a younger population. Actually, there's highest percentage was in the 20 to 29-year-old range, in part because um, their cases were um, largely um, driven by this religious group that tends to attract members in that age range. So they didn't have the same kind of hospitalizations that other countries did. Um, and they do remain susceptible. You know, additional cases could show up in their country, but I think they've so far built an infrastructure that could respond um, if they do see a rise in, in case numbers again. And I think the same for, um, for Singapore. So this is why I think it's critically important that in the United States, we figure out a way to test more people. Now, clearly there are places in the US right now that do not have the capacity to test more and where the health system is begging people not to show up just to be tested. Um, you know, I think an important rate limiting step for testing is just having the health um, care workers to be able to administer the tests. So we obviously need to not make any motions that puts more strain on the health system, even inadvertently. But I think to the extent that we can identify other testing modalities or ways to test even in a, in a survey-like fashion, I mean, we just need to do a better job of figuring out who has this virus and who doesn't so that we can better isolate people and keep them out of the hospital um, for as much as possible and preserve um, hospitals for uh, those who truly require hospitalization. Um, you know. I'm sure many places are seeing people using ERs as a way to get information. Um, and this is something that has happened in previous situations and we should anticipate um, that we'll see more of this, but it's also something that can be fixed through um, you know, better messaging from 
public health agencies and other resources, people need to be connected to clinical information, but it shouldn't be in an emergency room if necessary. So I'll end there and just give my thanks and I'm happy to you know, answer questions if we have time now or answer follow-up questions that are um, passed along to me to the best of my abilities. And I really, again, I'm so grateful for, for you all and the work that you do on our behalf and um, for your attention. So thanks so much.